Hello everyone. Welcome to A Voice for Men. I am Paul Elam and i uh, got a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the first things is that I'm coming to you for the first time with this kind of setup, uh, mean me sitting here uh, talking to a camera uh, directly instead of laying down a voice track and putting some images together and giving you the montage. Uh, I like doing that sort of thing, but I think it's time that I start catching up with the times and uh, coming to you in a more sort of uh, live format. So here we go with this. I'm going to hope to be doing a lot of it in the future if my subscribers like it. And if you do, please let me know. And if you don't, please let me know. And of course, if you don't like it, I'll just ignore you um, and pretend that you're a feminist. Anyway, there is a lot for me to talk about tonight. Uh, there has been an awful lot going on in the men's movement, and um, some of it I think is, uh, I don't want anybody out there that's interested in this stuff to have missed any of it, so I'm going to cover a little bit of it here. One story that I'm going to get to in more detail in just a few minutes is that uh, I just got back a couple of days ago from New York. Uh, I did a taping for ABC 2020, uh, about the manosphere, about the men's movement, ostensibly what it really is is a hit piece for 2020 to attack us, much in the way that uh, we've been attacked before uh, from feminists for, for being hate mongers and kitten eaters and uh, purveyors of filth and disgust and people who want to keep women in the sandwich mines forever. Uh, standard hit piece, only this time it'll be going out to 50 plus million people instead of uh, a few thousand like we're used to when we have media exposure. Uh, so that's worth talking about. It's worth talking about the experience for sure because it was something uh, being up there doing that. Also, Newsweek is coming out about the same time in the next week or so with an article. It's also a hit piece. Um, I think there's probably going to be a little bit more balance to the Newsweek piece than there is to 2020. Uh, I've talked with the guy that, that's written it. He's let me know that he's going to piss off a lot of MRAs and uh, he also claims he's going to piss off a lot of feminists. So if he pisses everybody off, it ought to be at least fairly balanced. Um, but I want to talk a little bit first before I get to those two things about my, some of my ideas for the men's movement of, of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and why I think it's important to go the direction that we're going. I think most people following the men's human rights movement pretty much know a lot of what I'm about to say, but I, I think that need to be said anyway. I think we sort of need to remind ourselves of some basics when we're looking at and what needs to happen in the men's movement, what kind of decisions are we going to make, how are we going to try to get this message out there, how are we going to try to get people to accept it, or if we're going to try to get people to accept it, how do we do that? How do we go about it? The first thing that to me it is absolutely essential to remember is that nobody gives a damn about men. You know, Warren Farrell wrote about this 20 some odd years ago in The Myth of Male Power. It's something that is not new. We've been aware that for as, as long as we've been a human species that men were disposable, that men were the sex that did the protection and provision. And if somebody had to buy the farm, it was the guy that was going to do it. I mean, that set us up for a lot of, of social custom and attitudes in people that put them in the mindset to disregard the pain of men and of boys too. Uh, we just don't see it. Uh, I know that many of you men's advocates have been out there beating your heads against brick walls, showing statistics about 93% of workplace deaths being male, about the, the number of men on battlefields that are dead, about the suicide rate in men. A lot of you were around recently with the, the, the tragic story uh, of Earl Silverman committing suicide because he tried for 20 years to get someone in the Canadian government and to try to get the Canadian population to pay attention to the reality that there were male victims of domestic violence. And he got nothing but laughed at and mocked and ridiculed. I think at one point he got a check for $700 or something like that, woo wee. Um, and he ended up committing suicide because he couldn't get any support for it. So when I say that people don't care about men and boys, I think it's real important that MRAs or MHRAs, however you want to define yourself, 
put a period at the end of the sentence. Get it. People don't care. You can't take the facts and figures about what's happening to men and boys in this culture, whether it's the idea that they're falling out of school, whether it's that we're drugging boys up on Ritalin, and whether or not we're mistreating them, or they're domestic violence victims that are being ignored, or they're rape victims that are being ignored, or they're murder victims that are being ignored, or they're conscripted into wars, and nobody's paying attention to the fact that it's just men that it's happening to. You can't take that message to the general public, no matter how terrible the things are you're talking about, and have anybody care. For the most part, 90 plus percent of the people you talk to are simply not going to give a damn about it. That is the way it is. So, you know, compared to the women's movement, who really had it built in, you know, society was was ready and willing to help women in every turn. If women said, eek, there's a mouse, there's 10 guys crawling out of the woodwork to kill the mouse. So the woman could step daintily down off the chair. And that's pretty much how the women's movement have gone. They have cried about injustice, whether it was there or not. And sometimes it was there, sometimes it wasn't. But whether or not there was injustice there, there were men to come out of the woodwork and, and help them set it right or to make it look like it was being set right or do anything to get them to quit complaining because that's what men do. They run to the rescue of women and they fix things so that women will feel safe and comfortable and warm and fuzzy and oh, if you happen to, to kill a bunch of men in the process, that's sort of just the cost of doing business because we certainly can't have unhappy or frustrated women in our culture. It's just not acceptable. So like I said, that is the picture that we have to deal with. I think that, that trying to work around that or to deny it or to pretend like it, it, things aren't that way is absolutely insane. And it is kind of frustrating for me sometimes when I see a lot of MRAs out there arguing with feminists about, ooh, look what's happening to men, and arguing with, with people in the blue pill public about, look what's happening to our boys. Folks, they don't care. They're wired not to care. What they do listen to is anger. And that's what I want to talk about. Uh, it's, it's why I think A Voice for Men has grown uh, so incredibly in such a short period of time is because rather than just develop another platform where men sit about in, in an erudite and um, scholarly fashion pontificate on the state of affairs for men and boys, they talk like they talk to each other in normal life. Men at A Voice for Men and now a lot of women talk about these issues with the indignation that they deserve. And we don't pull our punches. Uh, and a saying we have around AVFM is that if you want sugar coated, go get a donut. We don't candy coat things. We don't pretend to be having a discussion with a society that is not listening. And that's really important, I think, in the approach. Now, is there risks that come with that? Well, there certainly is. And uh, that, that brings into this uh, 2020 story that's happening. The only reason 2020 is covering a voice for men is because of some of the harsh rhetoric and the very, very offensive satire that we run. And I'll be the first to admit, and, and in, the, in the interview, they talked a lot about my satire. Um, it is very offensive. It's very harsh. It's very cutting. It's also the only reason 2020 would ever stop to think about talking to any of us. Otherwise, we would be ignored. That's our dilemma. That's the reality of it. And if we want to get this message out, because my idea, and let me see if I can put this together in a way that makes a whole lot of sense, is not that I went on 2020 because it would get out the message of the men's movement to 50 million people who would come to the site and say, oh, wow, this is great stuff, a new social revolution. We're going to help men. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. The reason that I was willing to go get beat up, and they are going to beat the living crap out of me on 2020. You can just set your watch by it, um, and we will get with you and let you know when that episode is going to air. It should be in the next week or two. But the reason that I went there is because there is a small percentage of the population, one, 
that is able to hear this and is willing to hear this. It's how I got here. It's how a lot of people in the men's human rights movement get here. It isn't because that there is a, a viable mass appeal market out there that we go after great numbers of people and that we'll scoop in a whole bunch of them. There is a really small percentage of men and women that can get past their own biological programming to protect women at the expense of men and actually look at men like they're human beings. There's a very small percentage of them that can look at the facts and say, hey, you know what? This stuff is wrong. Very, very small group of them. There's another group as well. And that is the men that have been screwed over in misandric culture. A lot of the people that are uh, participating in our movement are men that have been pulling knives out of their courts from our family courts that have been uh, had their lives destroyed from false accusations, men that uh, have seen everything that they've worked for, everything that they've owned, including their relationship with their children, all of it go down the drain because it's fashionable to treat men this way. It's all right, and nobody cares about it. And we're able to reach some of those people. We're not trying to reach out to the world and put a message out there that we think people are just going to have a light go on in their head and say, oh my God, I, why couldn't I have thought of this before? I just never considered how men were being treated. And, and yeah, we're going to do something about it. That's not the way this is working. What we have to do is cut through and use the media in a culture that doesn't care about men. Uh, 2020 isn't a big breakthrough for us. It's just another tool. Newsweek is not a big breakthrough. It's another tool to possibly reach people that have been affected by the issues that we, we talk about and discuss and for which we, we do advocacy and their family members. And it's a very small number of people, but it's also important to remember that social change doesn't happen because majority wants it. Social change happens because a minority of people recognize an injustice and make noise until it starts getting fixed, if they have the truth on their side. This was just as true with the civil rights movement. It wasn't certainly uh, every African American in the United States that was hitting the streets and protesting in the 60s. There was enough to burn Watts in Detroit, and there was enough to get on cameras and get people's attention and refuse to back down from water cannons and police dogs and all other manner of brutality and oppression in order to get them to shut up. But they got, got the message through and things have begun to change quite a bit. I mean, they've changed drastically from the world that I lived in uh, when I was 13, 14 years old. And that's what we're trying to do here is to make that change. Now, it's also important to remember that it's going to get a little nasty in the process. This piece on 2020, what they've done, I've talked with Elizabeth Vargas. She's a very, very tough, no-nonsense lady. I, I actually uh, had a lot of respect for her in some ways. Uh, the one place that I didn't is the one place that they're going to try to get us. Uh, what she did was she took my most provocative satire, uh, took little bitty snippets of it and, and read them, which I'm sure will be the only part of my writing that makes it onto that program, and insisted that she did not know that they were satire, even though I pointed out, one, that I wrote them as satire, and two, that I even took the ad additional step for, for the slower thinkers among us to say in the articles that they were satire. Um, uh, but she was steadfastly not going to hear that. They weren't satire. They were hate. And this is what you're going to see from this. And I can just see that uh, uh, by the time that uh, 2020 does their nine minutes on me, you're going to see little horns poking out from my head and, uh, uh, you know, maybe a little tail whipping around behind me and a pitchfork back there, some uh, smoke in the background. That's pretty much what we're going to be looking at. But what it's going to do is it's going to drive a lot of people to a voice for men.com out of those people a tiny tiny number of them and that's what we work with comparatively will look around the site and figure out that they've been lied to that the men's human rights movement is not about hating women it is not represented by its harshest satire that there is a 
large amount of activism going on and that there are horrendous issues that are being addressed that nobody else is looking at or doing anything about, um, except people in the men's human rights movement. We're certainly not seeing it from feminists. I know that uh, Big Red told us that, uh, that uh, feminists had it covered, uh, that they were really addressing all of our issues, and if we just uh, helped them dismantle patriarchy, uh, that uh, everything would be fine for men, of course. Um, my goodness, what can I say? I will tell you one little story here about the 2020 trip that I think is really funny. It's worth it. Um, as a little side piece that they wanted to do, in addition to my talk with Elizabeth Vargas, they put me in a cafe coffee shop um, in the hotel we were in with Jacqueline Friedman. <clears throat> Jacqueline Friedman is one of the founders of WHAM. Excuse me. And WHAM is the organization that conducted the um, anti-misogyny campaign uh, for, on Facebook to remove all the nasty, horrible uh, memes that were floating around that social networking site about women. And with the examples they gave in their campaign, there actually were some really nasty stuff. I, I wouldn't have them on my site, and I wouldn't blame Facebook for removing them. But of course, I wasn't fooled about what their real intentions were, uh, their idea of going in under the misogyny radar was to make sure that they started being able to strong arm people who dissented from feminist dogma, which is coincidentally exactly what happened within days of Facebook agreeing to that policy. Memes started disappearing off the A Voice for Men Facebook page that were supposedly in violation of community standards, and they were nothing like the misogynistic memes uh, that Wham came in the door with saying uh, was, was the reason that they were there. They were memes. One of them said that uh, uh, it challenged rape culture by providing some actual statistics from three Pennsylvania universities, major universities, of, of what their actual reported rapes were versus the one in four canard that, that feminists trot around all the time. And another one, which was admittedly quite provocative, but not in violation of community standards, is that I uh, took a meme that uh, was from the I Need Feminism Because campaign and replaced the text in it and put in there that I need feminism because if I kill my husband, feminists will defend me. Uh, I thought it was a really pretty funny meme and it was happening right around the Jody Arias trial, uh, which does point to a problem that men have in their treatment in criminal courts. Uh, was it misogynistic? No, it was critical of feminism. And proof it disappeared in violation of feminist, oh, excuse me, community standards for Facebook. Um, anyway, they put me in the hotel room with, the, or no, they did not put me in a hotel room with this woman. One more time, they did not put me in a hotel room with Jacqueline Friedman. They put me in a hotel coffee shop. And she came into the talk, cameras are rolling front and back of us, and she first announced that she didn't feel like she could be civil to me, uh, which I said okay to. I mean, that's, that's fine with me, and I suggested maybe that that was her problem and not mine. And then she launched into a tirade of false allegations whereby she accused me and the Manosphere and uh, anybody who ever descended from feminism apparently of being responsible for mass murders. Yes, folks, uh, I don't know if it'll make it to the actual airing that 2020 does, but she did say this on camera, uh, that I was responsible for mass murder. She said that I was responsible for a woman having to flee her home with her child under FBI direction. Um, and I told her I thought it was a little bit curious that if that actually happened, why I never got a call from the FBI, why if, if it was based on something that I did, if I created that kind of threat, you would think the, at least that the FBI would have given me, you know, a little ring up on the phone and say, hey, Paul, you know, don't do that. Uh, you're, you're causing people to have to leave their homes, and uh, uh, we'd really prefer you didn't do that. Um, I never heard from the FBI. I don't believe it happened. I, I told her so. She accused me of being, of course, a misogynist, uh, um, uh, swallowing kittens, whatever. But there was one long string of accusations, and uh, she also said that um, uh, one thing that was true, that uh, I had put an, a reward on our website for the identity of a feminist writer. 
And I said, oh, you mean Pamela O'Shaughnessy, uh, the novelist for Simon & Schuster that was writing articles about eugenics, reducing the population of men by 90% by any means necessary, including murder. And she closed with a line, something, oh, something really glib. What was it? Oh, yes, uh, we do it with corn. Men ought to be easy. And given that she was advocating mass murder and she was doing so under a false name and that she was um, doing so in an ideological community with followers that were certainly echoing and even increasing and getting more bombastic in their rhetoric uh, about this kind of approach to dealing with gender realities in this world, uh, I felt like it was a public service to find out who she was and identify her, and I would do it again, and I, and I told her that. Uh, but this is who they sent up against me, was this neurotic false accuser. And again, it was another indication to me that by the time they get done with this piece, it's going to be, ooh, man, I tell you, I might want to get some Kevlar. Uh, for all the accusations that Elizabeth Vargas made about trying to promote violence and all the accusations that Jacqueline Friedman made about trying to promote violence, these were also the same people that were coming across with misrepresenting my work intentionally, intentionally telling outright lies about stuff that I had done that had absolutely never happened, saying that I had inspired mass murder. So I got to ask you, Who's trying to promote violence against who here? Who's really trying to promote the violence? Because, you know, it's not me. Uh, we've had a strictly nonviolent platform for as long, uh, well, I've had it for myself in life for uh, all my adult life. And uh, aside from a couple of fist fights when I was a teenager, uh, I have been nothing but a pacifist my entire life. Um, this is really, really frustrating at times, I'm not going to lie to you, but it is a necessary part of what's going to have to happen. And I guess I want to close with saying this. You know, am I worried about this stuff? Am I worried about being demonized this way? Yeah, a little bit. I am. I'm not going to lie about it. I'm not going to stop. Uh, and I don't think anybody else at A Voice for Men is going to stop. But what I want to say is that, folks, this is a cultural war that we're in. This is a nasty business that we're in. And unless we're going to sit back and watch our young men continue to be discriminated against in our colleges and universities, if, unless we're going to sit back and continue to allow false allegations to run rampant and destroy men's lives, uh, unless we're going to continue to stand by silently while all these lies about rape culture and the incidents and, and origin of domestic violence and all the millions of dollars of funding and ideological bedrock that is formed off of the, these garbage uh, ideological tenets, unless we're just going to sit back and let it all happen, we're going to have to mix it up. We're going to have to provoke people. We're going to have to make it angry. It doesn't mean that I necessarily like it. I mean, on some days I do, uh, because I think these people have some real stuff coming to them. Uh, I was particularly disappointed that Kathy Young, who has written a lot of great stuff over the years for uh, newspaper publications as a syndicated columnist, comes out of the blue uh, well, I don't really think it was out of the blue. I think it was orchestrated. But she, she more or less came out of the blue attacking a voice for men as having a steady diet of misogyny, woman-hating, whatever. Uh, she offered no evidence. She's never offered any evidence publicly, she, and she doesn't have any evidence. Here's a deal with Kathy Young and with other people of her ilk. You know, it's one thing to write about men's issues when you do so from the air-conditioned comfort of your, your cushy abode wherever you are and where you can still have martinis with uh, these ideologues when you're not talking about what a, what a raw deal that men are getting, how much help that they need. It's, it's really great when you've got a writing career that, that actually pays you for saying some things that address men's issues in this culture. And I'm glad that it happens. Uh, but who has Kathy Young ever gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with about these issues?
Kathy Young addresses an ideology of feminism, uh, which she is critical of at times. Yet she's only so critical. She'll only go so far. And folks, things have gone too far to accept that as adequate anymore. I'm glad Kathy Young does what she does, but I tell you what, I'm personally through bowing and scraping and paying homage to people who practice men's rights activism or who acknowledge men's issues at arm's length while they're sipping latte and eating scones and lifting little pinkies in the process and somehow want to turn around and condescend toward me, toward the good people that are voice for men who are actually dealing with guys that are pulling knives out of their backs, who are, are in and out of jails because they're being harassed by corrupt prosecutors and corrupt judges, and who are taking the risk of fighting the battles that actually need to be fought out here. And so if somebody wants to, you know, kiss Kathy Young's ass for um, uh, what she does, I mean, that's fine, but I'm going to pass on it. We need soldiers, guys. We need real soldiers. And of course, for the idiots out there, they're going to misinterpret that statement. I mean, we need cultural soldiers. We need soldiers with pins. We need soldiers with laptops. We need soldiers that are willing to step up and make challenges and confront these judges and confront these prosecutors and confront this culture and confront people like Kathy Young to stop and think about what they're doing and whether or not it's actually addressing any of the problems. Because here's the deal, and I asked this of Elizabeth Vargas in the interview that I had with her, and she had no answer. She told me about all the things, and I'm sure that she was referring to, to one of Kathy Young's articles. But she told me about all the stuff that she had seen about addressing men's issues, and I asked her what is being done about any of them. And she didn't have an answer. She couldn't even talk for a moment. And the next thing that came out of her mouth was, you have a good point. Folks, I'm not here to tell anybody else what they have to do, what they don't have to do. I am here to defend a voice for men, to, to defend our actions, uh, and to try to help push them and, and multiply them as much as possible. So far, it's working really good. And with that, uh, I'm going to wrap it up and say good day, good night, good morning, whenever you're watching this to everyone. Uh, come visit avoiceformen.com. By the way, there's a, an, a link in the low bar there that will point you to an article written about this and a discussion that's going on about it. Um, come on over and join us and register and feel free to participate in the discussion. Uh, we'll be glad to have you. See you next time.